Hello everyone in Cardio Minds channel and welcome back to the guidelines of heart failure. After we finish the span of video of the heart failure medications, and today we are discussing an important line of non-pharmacological treatment for heart failure, which is ICD therapy, and we are focusing here on the patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So we are not discussing ICD therapy in general for structural heart disease. In our agenda today, we are discussing the role of ICD for secondary prevention and then for primary prevention, when to consider subcutaneous ICD, sometimes abbreviated as SICD, and when to consider wearable cardioverter defibrillator. Let's start with the secondary prevention dealing with the patients who developed VT or VF. If we compared ICD with amiodarone for secondary prevention, of course ICD wins as it significantly reduced mortality in survivors of cardiac arrest and patients with symptomatic ventricular arrhythmias. But you should take into account before deciding to implant an ICD, the patient's opinion after you discuss with him the pros and cons of ICD, the quality of life after having a shock device beneath his skin, the LV ejection fraction as a survival benefit for ICD is uncertain if the ejection fraction is above 35%. And of course, we should take into account the life expectancy and absence of fatal diseases. And so there is a class 1 recommendation for ICD for secondary prevention in order to reduce the risk of sudden death and all-cause mortality in patients who have recovered from a ventricular arrhythmia causing hemodynamic instability expected to survive for more than one year with good functional status and in absence of reversible cause unless the ventricular arrhythmia has occurred in less than 48 hours after MI. And this drags us to a big no. Don't implant an ICD for a ventricular tachyarrhythmia that occurred within 48 hours of the onset of MI as this is a period of electrical instability and so after 48 hours, we can decide whether the patient would need ICD or not if the ventricular tachyarrhythmia is recurred after this window phase. And when we program an ICD for secondary prevention, it is tailored according to the patient's clinical indication. And so the tachycardia zone at which the ICD starts its therapies, which is usually by ATB, standing for anti-tachycardia pacing, it is adjusted at more than or equal 40 milliseconds than the patient's tachycardia cycle length. So we calculate the cycle length from the patient's clinical VT and then add 40 milliseconds to the cycle length. So this is the start of the ICD targeted therapies. And now let's move to the debatable issue of role of ICD for primary prevention dealing with patients who did not develop any VT or VF. Needless to say that the rates of sudden cardiac death decreased by 44% over the 20-year period from mid-1990s to 2015, and this is due to the advances in guideline recommended heart failure medication as we discussed before, and also the role of CRT pacemakers in improving LV dysfunction and improving the LV dysynchrony. But of course, you need to avoid the dry drone as it is not favored in patients with severe LV dysfunction and the class 1 antiarrhythmics as disopramide, flicinide, and propafenone which are QT prolongers resulting in increased risk of sudden cardiac death. If we ask the famous question which has a higher risk of sudden cardiac death, ischemic or non-ischemic etiology, of course the patient with ischemic heart disease and ischemic LV dysfunction have greater risk of scar related VT and so greater risk of sudden cardiac death than non ischemic cardiomyopathy. And therefore, the absolute benefit of ICD is greater in those patients with ischemic heart disease. But remember, when to decide for ICD implantation in those patients after a minimum duration of three months of optimized medical treatment and it failed to increase the LV ejection fraction, to more than 35%, including the use of the class 1 recommended medications for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. However, most of the cited ICD trials 
were performed before the use of ARNI and GLOT2 inhibitors, and so the benefit may be different after the use of these medications, which have been recently approved as class 1 medications for heart failure. Another famous question, does ICD implantation reduce mortality if we use it for primary prevention in patients with heart failure, but ejection fraction more than 35%? There is an ongoing trial at the time being for ICD therapy in patients who have scars on the cardiac MRI and so the proof of structural heart disease. But there is no indication or recommendation so far to put an ICD for a patient with ejection fraction above this cutoff point of 35% just for primary prevention. So all the patients who would receive ICD for primary prevention should have an ejection fraction less than 35%. In the famous Danish trial, which we should speak about today in our video, the rates of sudden cardiac death were low in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, as only 70 out of 1,116 patients, we are speaking about just 6.2% of the patients followed up over 5 years had sudden death, and there was just a modest absolute reduction in sudden death in patients with a defibrillator-containing device, including just ICD or CRTD. And so this did not significantly improve the overall risk of mortality in patients receiving defibrillation, and so this doubting the benefit of ICD in those patients. However, a subgroup analysis suggests that there was a benefit in patients less than 70 years in comparison to the elderly population, and in a recent meta-analysis of studies that examined the effect of ICD in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, a survival benefit was still seen, although the effect was significantly weakened by the inclusion of the Danish trial. So the Danish trial, one of the studies that decreased the benefit of ICD in those with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, although the meta-analysis, of course, showed us a slightly different result. But please remember that non-ischemic cardiomyopathy is not just a single disease entity. It is a heterogeneous condition with certain subgroups at higher risk of sudden cardiac death, like laminopathies, which contains the lamin gene mutation, or the chronic inflammatory disease of the sarcoidosis infiltrating the myocardium, and here with a may need careful consideration of ICD implantation due to the relatively higher risk of sudden cardiac death than other types of dilated cardiomyopathy. So from all this discussion, what is the essence or the net result for the role of ICD for primary prevention? The ICD has a class 1 recommendation to reduce the risk of sudden death and all-cause mortality in patients with symptomatic heart failure near class 2 or 3 of an ischemic etiology unless he had an MI in the prior 40 days and an LV ejection fraction less than or equal 35%, despite three months of optimized medical treatment, provided that they are expected to survive for longer than one year with good functional status. So, ICD has a class 1 in ischemic LV dysfunction with these criteria. Whereas it has a class 2A recommendation to reduce risk of sudden death and all cause mortality as well. In patients with symptomatic heart failure near class 2 to 3 of a non ischemic etiology and ejection fraction less than 35%, despite three months of optimized medical treatment, provided that they are expected to survive longer than one year with good functional status. So here they are having the same criteria as the previous recommendation, excluding here that we are not speaking about the first 40 days after MI because it is a non ischemic etiology, but it is a class 2A in non-ischemic LV dysfunction rather than class 1 in ischemic LV dysfunction. So remember that primary prevention ICD has a class 1 in ischemic LV dysfunction and class 2A in non-ischemic LV dysfunction. We are speaking about primary prevention, not secondary prevention. We always emphasize the importance to exclude the first 40 days after the onset of MI from the decision of ICD for primary prevention. There are two randomized controlled trials that showed no benefit in patients who received an ICD within the first 40 days after MI. Why? 
because here the sudden arrhythmic deaths were reduced yes but this was balanced by an increase in non-arrhythmic deaths during this period the most famous cause is pump failure and so there is a big no as icd implantation is not recommended for primary prevention within the first 40 days after mi as the implantation here does not improve the prognosis when we mentioned symptomatic heart failure in the previous recommendation we mentioned MIHA class 2 or 3 what about severe heart failure patient having MIHA class 4 symptoms here the reduction in sudden death may be partially or wholly offset by an increase in the death due to worsening of heart failure the most famous example is pump failure and that's why the ICD therapy is not recommended in patients with NIHA class 4 with severe symptoms refractory to pharmacotherapy and they are not candidates for LV assess device or heart transplantation and also in patients with serious comorbidities unlikely to survive more than one year with good quality of life are unlikely to have a benefit from ICD as here the mean cause of mortality is non-arrhythmic death either related to the cardiac condition due to pump failure or due to non-cardiac condition for example advanced malignancy and so there is another big no that ICD therapy is not recommended in patients with NIHA class 4 with severe symptoms refractory to pharmacological treatment unless they are candidates for CRT ventricular assist device or transplantation in this case we can discuss the role of benefit for ICD when we put an ICD for prime prevention we don't have here a clinical tachycardia in order to adjust the tachycardia zone according to the clinical tachycardia cycle lens and so we try as much as we can to minimize the pacing and here we usually adjust the ventricular demand pacing at 40 feet per minute and adjust the tachycardia treatment zone usually at more than 200 feet per minute sometimes there is different situation according to the different subtypes of the LV dysfunction but these are usually the followed parameters before putting an ICD you need to discuss with your patient some of the pros and cons of the ICD and so there is some advice that you need to give to your patient you need to make him or her aware of the potential complication related to the implantation procedure aware of the implication related to driving according to the law in each country aware of the risk of inappropriate shocks that sometimes occur from the ICD due to misdetection of some of the intrinsic tachycardia as VT or sometimes due to electromagnetic interference from outside and aware of the circumstances where ICD or the defibrillator component of CRTD may be deactivated for example in terminal disease or explanted in case of infection or sometimes recovery of LV function as in myocarditis or peripartum cardiomyopathy. When you are faced with a situation of battery in the life in a conventional pacemaker, usually rush to arranging for an elective battery replacement. But this is not the situation in ICD as it should not be replaced automatically. The patient here should be carefully evaluated by an experienced cardiologist before generator replacement as the management goals, the patient's needs, and the clinical status may have changed. For example, the LV function may be higher at the time being than before, as in case of myocarditis or peripartum cardiomyopathy. Sometimes the risk of fatal arrhythmia may be lower and the patient did not receive any therapy during the whole period of the ICD implanted. And sometimes the risk of non-arrhythmic deaths may be higher as in case of severe advanced heart failure due to pump failure or due to the risk of other non cardiac comorbidities but there is a controversy that the patient whose LV ejection fraction improved and did not require any therapy during the ICD lifetime either anti-tachycardia pacing or shocks should have another device implanted or not so far there is no a clear recommendation to solve this issue now let's speak shortly about the role of subcutaneous ICD the main advantages of SICD that it is suitable for patients with difficult venous access as here I don't need a cephalic or axillary venous access I put the pattery and leads the neck, the skin 
and so it is suitable also for patients who require ICD extraction due to pocket infection. But there are some disadvantages that you and your patient should be aware of in order to choose whether SICD is suitable or the patient should have a transvenous ICD. SICD cannot treat cardiarrhythmia except for just the post shock pacing after delivering the shock. So we cannot put them in patients who have underlying sinus node dysfunction or AV block plus the indication for ICD. SICD cannot deliver anti-tachycardia pacing, they just depend on the shock to terminate the VT or VF and they don't deliver biventricular pacing and so they don't improve the interventricular dysynchrony in patients with LV systolic dysfunction. There is less ability to discriminate the SVT from VT because here we are speaking just about one lead sensing the ventricular signal rather than two leads in dual chamber transvenous ICD and so there is a higher risk of inappropriate shocks than transvenous ICD. So after discussing this advantage and disadvantage with your patient, the SICD are proved to be non-inferior to transvenous ICD in this regard. However, much more substantial randomized control trial with this device and more long-term data on the safety and efficacy are awaited before putting a clear recommendation to use SICD. And finally, with the role of wearable cardioverter defibrillator, and from its name, it's just worn by the patient, not implanted, and so it is not an ICD, it's a separate entity. This device may be considered for a limited period of time in selected heart failure patients at high risk for sudden cardiac death, but otherwise they are not suitable for long-term ICD implantation. So we are speaking here about a temporary indication for cardioverter defibrillator therapy rather than long-term indication. However, the large VIS trial failed to show that this device reduced arrhythmic death in patients with ejection fraction less than or equal 35% following a recent acute MI. And so there is just a class 2B recommendation to use a wearable cardioverter defibrillator for patients with heart failure at risk of sudden cardiac death for a limited period of time or as a bridge to an implanted cardioverter defibrillator device. So we have reached the end of our video today as we discussed the four topics related to ICD for heart failure. And so our take home message today is that before deciding for ICD implantation for a heart failure patient, please think of the quality of life, life expectancy and benefits versus risk for the patient. It is not just a decision that you take solely without discussing with your patient the pros and cons of this device and whether this patient would benefit from it or there is no actual benefit. Thank you very much for watching this video and wait next week for another line of treatment for heart failure.